Welcome to Nick's Home Court with your host. My name is Greg Armstrong. This is episode number 65. The sneaky killer strikes again. <laughs> Along with Frankie, baby. Along with Lance, make him dance. Oh, he's not Lance, make him dance. Lance stopped him from dancing. Thomas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Knicks are now 6-4, and four, two games over 500. They played, uh, I would say, an incomplete game, but they played their best in the most important time of the game. And as I'm watching the game, I'm looking at it, and as I'm look, I'm always thinking about the show. To be honest, I'm always thinking about the show and what I'm going to say. Normally, like sometimes I take notes, and sometimes I just make mental notes. And... As I'm watching the game, this is something that every NBA team does that frustrates the hell out of me. The Knicks do it, and I know it's coaching. Again, three points is more than two points. When you got a team that's lighting you up from three, you have to do everything to keep them from shooting the three point. It's not just uh, uh, contesting, because basically, I'm kind of cold on contesting three-point shots. I don't really like that because a lot of times you may foul the shooter. They still make the shot. You're not blocking the shot. The best thing is if you're up in a player's grill, unless that player is Steph Curry or Durant, you know, and other great, great NBA shooters, they're not going to shoot the ball. They're going to fake and they're going to penetrate. And when they fake and penetrate through the lane, a lot of times these guys are not adept to doing that. Not every player. The best ones... You, you just ain't going to stop them no matter what you do. But I noticed that. And I want to say that next time you watch a game, be it the Knicks or any other team, pay attention to the defense, right? The thing that aggravates me, you know, the corner three is the shortest three-point shot in the NBA. And every time the ball's on one side of the court and the, the guy standing behind the three-point line in the other corner, that man who's guarding him always ends up under the rim. And that shit frustrates me, either under the rim or up by the free throw line. And then the ball somehow, because the ball is faster than your, your feet, the ball can move faster than you can. And somehow the ball magically goes to the corner where that fucking guy is supposed to be. You see it with all the NBA teams. The better ones do a little better at it. Better defensive ones do better. My thing is, there's nothing wrong with sagging off your man if uh, the ball's on the other side of the court. But you need to stay in enough distance where you can get back to that man. You should not be under the basket if you're a fucking guard. Like basket hanging. You should not be at the, the, the free throw line and your man is all in the corner. And so many times I saw that with the Knicks. It's almost like the play. I'm watching, I'm watching Charlotte run their play. And I'm like, they're trying to get a corner three before it even starts. I know. They're going to do pick and roll with Kimba. They're going to... Make two other passes, and somehow it's going to find to that corner three where your fucking ass is under the hoop. And it happened time and time again with the Knicks. Now, I saw one thing that when Frank Nilakina, and it wasn't in this game, it was a previous game, where he sagged off his man, but he was aware. One thing about I love about Frank is he's defensively aware of not just his man, but the, the play. That is high, high defensive IQ. And one time, the ball had swung to the other side of the court. He sagged off his man, but he saw where the play was going, and he intercepted the pass. I saw Courtney Lee do that as well. That's a good defensive play. You can be a decoy. You can sag off your man as a decoy and get the steal. That's what the great defenders do. But I'm tired of seeing the Knicks rotate to the point and you see the man and he's standing in the corner. There was a couple of times Malik Monk is lighting it up and you're still leaving him open. That should never happen. That should never happen. Just stand next to him. He's not going to shoot that. By the way, speaking of Malik Monk, great game, much respect. You know, and I know halfway through the game, people were like, see Malik Monk. Oh God, we should have picked it. We should have drafted him. And you know what? I saved this for the podcast. Remember what I told you? Frank Nilakina is a winning player. And that's very important. You have winning players and you have players that can light it up. You see, Steph Curry can light it up, but he's a winning player. He makes defensive players. He plays. He makes steals. He does a lot of other ancillary little small things that makes his team win. That's what great players do. 
when I look at Malik Monk, he's going to be able to fill it up. He's going to have amazing games and things like that. But when he wasn't scoring, what was he doing on the court? What what else was he doing? Was he defending? Did he get any steals? Did he did he uh, pressure his man into a turnover? Did he do any of those things? Only time you knew Malik Monk was on the court is when he was shooting a three or, or scoring. And he's a magnificent scorer, but he's, that's what he does. Right now, he looks like Lou Williams, with a, of course, with a better jump shot. Now, he might turn out to be a great player. But what happened in that fourth quarter when the Knicks started to lock down on that defense? Was there anything else he could do? You see, Frank Nellikino only had three points. He didn't even shoot well. But you can't tell me he didn't help guide that team to victory. He had eight assists, the offense, he was running the offense efficiently, and he played some great disruptive, disruptive defense with him and Lance Thomas. Now, I, now that I mentioned Lance Thomas, I don't want people saying, oh, he needs to be in the starting lineup. You know what? The team is winning. They have some synergy. Leave everything alone. You don't mess with that. You bring in Lance, maybe in the fourth quarter, second half, when the de- team is lacking defensively, and you and you br- you bring it in two players who plays. And Lance is looking healthy. We never doubted if Lance can play defense and hit a key shot, but he's looking healthy and getting confident. He might end up in a starting lineup just because – if Lance Thomas was healthy and not been injured last year and a half, he probably would be starting anyway. You know, he probably would be. But, you know, now he's getting his confidence. And it's still good to have a defensive stopper come off the bench, almost like a closer, to have him and Frank come off the bench. And literally all that shit y'all was doing, all them three points y'all was doing, that shit about to come to an end. And that's exactly what the Knicks did in the fourth quarter, chased him off the three-point line. And another thing, too, I know a lot of people will say, why did the Knicks wait to that long to clamp down? And one thing about the NBA, these guys are very talented, both teams. And what happens is sometimes a team has to catch you, has to has to adjust and adjust and adjust and figure out what you're doing and then – Usually, hopefully, before the game is over, lock down on that. The better teams in the league do that. Usually by the third quarter, I've seen so many games where teams who are not that good have a hot shooting court half. And in the third quarter, the team, midway through the third, you see the better team start to say, okay, we're going to put a stop to that. How else are you going to beat us? And the Knicks did it in the fourth quarter. Took them some time, but they put a stop to it. I remember saying in the game, I felt the Knicks' energy was lacking. That's why I wanted them to put the, the younger players in. And the players who don't usually play that much because, like tonight, it's going to be a tough game. You might see Damian Dotson tonight. I think you're going to see Michael Beasley. They're going to go deep. In, they're going to have to. There's been a lot of games. I mean, Chris Stapps may not play the full game. Folks, if they win this game, it'll be gravy. I'm not expecting a victory, but if they win this game, it'll be super gravy. And it'll show me that this team is is on some serious shit. You know, But it's still early in the season, but I'm just saying. And like I said, effort is sustainable. They're winning this game, these games, not by hot shooting, but by effort, defensive and offensive execution. That is sustainable, folks. So when people say, wait to 20 games and see in 20 games, we don't know what's going to happen. Other teams are going to execute and try to figure out what the Knicks are doing defensively and offensively. First of all, when you're playing good defense, this really not much adjustment you could do to a good when it's a good defensive team. That's, you know, they're a good defensive team. That's why people say defense wins championships or defense wins. The reason why defense wins is cuz defense is consistent. You can bring that effort every night. Shooting go comes and goes, but you can bring that defensive effort every single night. You know, so when I'm looking at the game you know, and I see Nilakina coming. I'm actually happy for the defense. And he's really becoming a master at that pick and roll and finding the open man. One pleasant surprise, I did not know he was as gifted a passer as he is. He had eight assists and he didn't even play 30 minutes. When he starts the game, I, I think he's going to average 10, 10, 11 assists, man. He might not even score much. And I think he will. People keep saying he's not a scorer. I think that he's letting that part of the game come to him. 
He's he has to learn when to pass, when not to pass, when to score, when the you know he it, it, it's a big adjustment for a point guard. But he has the best part down. He has the two most important parts down to being a point guard. Years ago, point guards didn't score. Point guards would average thirteen points, eight assists, and play good defense. Like that was the point guard position. You know, you'd be a great back in the days. A great point guard may average 15 points and 10 assists. That's a great point in good defense. That's a great point guard back in the days. They wasn't scoring 25 and 30 points a game. The game has changed more towards the small guy and the point guard. However, I mean, if you look at Jason Kidd's numbers, he's never averaged. I don't think he's ever averaged 20 points a game. But he controlled the game. You can control the game without scoring, folks. You can control the game by getting everybody the ball. And you know what happens when you have a point guard who's a pass-happy point guard? You got people making harder cuts. You have people moving without the ball, knowing that their quarterback, their 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 quarterback is going to get them the ball. And the reason why I say quarterback because that's what he is out there. When you have a Aaron Rodgers throwing you the ball, you think you're going to bullshit on your route? You got Tom Brady throwing you the ball. You're going to run your routes hard. And when you got a point guard who's going to get you the ball, you're going to play according to that when you have an unselfish guard. Then you're going to tell the guard to shoot every now and then because he needs to do that. He needs to be more aggressive. We know it's coming. It's coming. But I know when he got that charge call, everybody's like, oh, don't be that aggressive. Now, what he's going to learn, see, he got a charge call, but all he had to do, what I want Nilakina to do eventually, and maybe he'll – expand beyond that but when he gets in that paint area he needs to do that teardrop or just pull up because he's so much bigger he's so much bigger than Kemba Walker he didn't have to get a charge but I felt like he was barreling and he really didn't know what he was going to do at that moment he got to learn and this was the better offensive players do they have spots on the floor where they like to shoot just like Jared Jack he loves by the key he loves to shoot uh, by the free throw line he loves to shoot around that area and every time he shoots that shot I know it's going in most of the time because that's his shot he lives off that shot what I'm saying is that Nilakina, when he gets in the paint area like that with these little guards just pull up and shoot over them or shoot a teardrop they have no chance of blocking your shot because he's a point guard version damn near of Chris Stapps. he's six foot five with seven foot wingspan shoot that teardrop who's blocking that now, when you're going against the center, that's different. But when you're going against Kimba, he should have pulled up right in front of Kimba in your face. But he kept going. He got a charge call, and he will learn that, and he will be coached up. But make no mistake, folks, them winning this game has a lot to do with Nilakina. Okay? And by the way, you know me. I told you I don't really like plus minuses. But for the sake of the podcast and for the sake of what I saw, because one thing about the advanced stacks, I watch the games. I can analyze what's going on without the numbers. I see what's going on without the numbers. But then you look back on the numbers, sometimes to see if what you're seeing is correct. And when I saw the game, I was like, yo, he's having a great effect on the Knicks offensively and defensively. And sure enough, his plus minus was plus 14. You know what Monk's plus minus was? Minus 11. With all that three-point shooting, minus 11. So, Anybody tell you about Malik Monk and Dennis Scott? No, Dennis Scott. Dennis Smith. Look, man, I'd rather have a winning basketball player, basketball player anytime. You know who was a winning basketball player who wasn't flashy, who didn't score a lot of points, who's in the Hall of Fame? God bless him. Dennis Johnson, who played for the Celtics. Lockdown defender. Got the team into their offensive flow. Hit big shots when they needed it. See, because that's what a point guard does. A point guard doesn't just automatically score no he gets everybody rolling oh y'all struggling right now let me let me shoot a few shots and even Jared Jack did that the Knicks are struggling let me hit a couple of shots in a row to get them you know to give them confidence that's what a point guard does that's a real that's that's actually I'm not going to say these other guys aren't point guards but that's what a winning point guard does like Nilakina is going to be that kind of player and you, you saw it last night where three points didn't shoot well, but you can't tell me he didn't help with that. He wasn't as important as Chris Stapps was when Chris Stapps was hitting those shots. And speaking of Chris Stapps, man, my segues are just flowing this morning. <laughs> speaking of Chris Stapps, what more can I say about him right now? 
I don't care. And, and now, now I don't know if ESPN heard me, <laughs> but I listened to the broadcast of, after the game. You know, I always listen to. I like to hear it. I'm a Nick fan. I'm I'm an enthusiast when it comes to the Knicks. So after the game, you know, I said, let me put it on. And sure enough, I think they had Daltrey or one of the guys come on ESPN New York and they were talking next smart move that's what you do you have a whole damn city that's getting excited about this team and you're not going to talk about them but folks do me a favor no matter how much they talk about the Knicks keep checking here keep checking here because they're going to give you they're going to what's going to happen if the Knicks keep winning they're going to overdo it now because they don't know how to enjoy the moment they, they they're trying to get callers now this is not one of those things where you get callers they're trying to get callers so they're going to say oh well Chris Stapps or oh, this team they're going to start looking too far ahead oh this playoff team oh he's MVP and no I don't want to have that discussion right now I want to enjoy each moment that's how you do you enjoy the moments I enjoyed yesterday's game there's a game tonight period now when we get into game 50 or 60 and Chris Stapps is still doing that we can have that MB MVP talk the Knicks are over 500 in the playoff because first of all the Knicks will not Chris Tapps would not be an MVP player if the Knicks are an eighth seed. It's not happening. He's not even, he'll get a couple of votes. The Knicks need to be in the top four seed for him to be MVP. So don't let nobody bullshit you. That's how the MVP goes. They gave it to Russell Westbrook. I think his team was like the fifth seed or the sixth seed. And that's because he did something that nobody has. I mean, the last person that done it was Oscar Robinson. He averaged a, averaged a triple double. That's equivalent to hitting 70 home runs in the season. You hit 70 home runs and your team's a last place team, they're probably going to give you the MVP. You hit 70 home runs. You know? In football, the same thing. You put up astronomical stats. You are running back. You run for 2,500 yards. Most of the time, they're going to give you the MVP. Yes. Chris Stapps averages 40. There's nothing they're going to They're going to give him the MVP. But the way he's playing now, the Knicks need to be at least a top four or fifth seed for him to be MVP. So any talk like that, I don't want to hear that shit into game 60, game 50. Then then, then we could talk that shit. Now, there's nothing wrong with the fans cheering MVP. Because how I look at it, when they cheer MVP, he's the MVP of the Knicks, no doubt. He's the MVP of the game that he's playing in, no doubt. But MVP of the league, not yet. Let's, let's hold off on Let's enjoy these moments. Because that's the problem. When you start getting too high and then things start faltering or something else happens or he comes back down to earth or, or maybe, you know, you're setting yourself up for failure. Don't do it. Just enjoy the moment. Get hoarse. In other words, cheer until your voice is gone. Whatever you do. But enjoy these moments. Again, I like to see growth, and that's what we're seeing right now. I'm really excited about Nilakina because I know Chris Stapps is good. If Nilakina because we might have something, right, that you see in young teams. Remember, Golden State got a Steph Curry. They knew he was good. Then they got a Klay Thompson. That team started becoming great when Klay Thompson started balling. Steph was already balling. Klay Thompson started balling. Draymond Green was a budding uh, everything man, like a super-duper glue guy. You started saying, damn, they got something here. Then they got in the playoffs and they lost in the first round. And this is the thing you want to see. Chris Stapps needs a running mate. Hardaway got signed to be a running mate, but it's starting to look like Nilakina might be the running mate sooner than later. And you know what? I want to give a big plus and a, he and a thumbs up to Dirk Doug McDermott. Played a very good game off the bench. Again, I had wanted to see him start, but you know what? Don't mess with don't mess up what's working. Only time like if, if McDermott goes for 20 points the next five games in a row, seven games, if he starts the ball out, then you have to reconsider that. Or you could just still keep him off the bench because all that matters is how many minutes he plays. Starting is for high schoolers. NBA players, as long as they're getting 30 minutes a night, they don't care. Unless they're trying to make all-star teams. And young players care about that stuff. So, you know, he looked like he's taking Beasley slot. You know, and, 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 and I have one thumbs down. I have a minus for Tim Hardaway. And the minus is not that he's shooting bad. I, I'm not going to be a prisoner of the moment as far as he's shooting bad right now. He's not really playing well or living up to the contract. That's his money. I'm not counting his money. My problem with him is he needs to show a higher IQ on offense. And... 
he for the most part he's done a good job containing himself and I know he wants to score these points I know he thinks he's a great player and that's fine there's nothing wrong with that but you saw one time and I was impressed with Chris Stapps he came down and shot a three and it wasn't like he was open the guy was right there he shot a quick three and Chris Stapps told him like you know what are you doing like calm down dog it's this fuck are you doing I don't like when the Knicks come down and shoot quickly and don't run through their sets. I don't like that. Even when Chris Stapps, I told you, when Chris, now he will be able to go one-on-one more off the, as he gets older and as he gets better at it. But when I saw him at the top of the key trying to make something happen, I said, this is going to end badly. No, it has to be in the flow of the offense right now. you know, And eventually he'll be able to just do it on his own. But uh, the reason why, yeah, but so that's the thing why I gave uh, Hardaway. He didn't play badly yesterday. It was just times in the game because what we need Hardaway to do, something that Nilakina I don't think is capable of yet, is when they leave Hardaway in the game and Chris Stapps goes to the bench, Hardaway needs to score. He needs to make shots. He needs to be a serious threat. This erratic offensive play, can't you can't be a threat when you're not consistent. You only a threat when you're hot. And then the way he's playing, he's going to shoot himself out of being hot half the time. He needs to show higher IQ. He's gone to the rim, but he's need to, he needs to go to the rim even more. If you're missing your shots, I understand you could shoot him in practice. You're probably hitting 20 in a row. But if you miss the first two, take it to the rack the next four times. And you know what happens when you take it to the rack the next four times? That fifth time, they're going to sag off. Then you got to open three. Maybe you'll hit it then. But remember, the best shot in the NBA is still the one under the hoop. Because if you don't make it, you could be fouled. For example, when the Knicks blocked, uh, was it Tyler Zeller's shot about 18 times, the 19th time, he got fouled. He got fouled. He still got free throws out of it. That's why they call it the best shot in the game. Three-point shot, yes, is the second best shot, but the best shot is the one under the hoop, right there by the hoop. Because your percentages, if you look at it, that's where the highest percentages, that's why centers usually have the highest percentages. Your percentage is higher, usually around 60 to 65%. And if you don't make it, a good chance you're going to get fouled. So that's why uh, I I want... Uh, a harder way to get to the rim more often if his shot is not falling. So I just want to see that improvement from him. But other than that, he played a decent game. And what you saw tonight, folks, what you saw tonight, which is so impressive. I'm sorry, not tonight. Last night, what you saw that was so, so impressive about this team. They played team ball Ball basketball goes to the entire team. Yeah, Chris Stapps is the leader of the team as far as scoring and, and ability, but they played as a team. It was like this was like a movie, little bits and pieces and parts to it. McDermott coming off the bench after Chris Stapps get hit and almost knocked on the floor. I mean, knocked on the floor. McDermott hits a three. You know, people were playing their parts, and that's a team, folks. Cantor didn't have a great game, but guess what? Kylo Quinn was right there to ball out, making great passes and stuff like that. There's some synergy going on, and there's some great effort, and, 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 and that is very, very important, and that can be sustained. I will always, always say that. And my hat's off to Jeff Hornacek. That's why we all need to shut the fuck up and stop trying to be the coach. We're not there in practice. We've never played in the league. We don't know what the hell we talking about when it comes to coaching. Okay? That's why I might get frustrated with certain moves coaches do, but I keep I just just look at it. I just like, you know what? He has inf- inside information. It's like a parent. I'm a parent. I've had people tell me things about my kid like, "Oh, you should try this and try this or or maybe it's this, maybe it's that." And I'm thinking, "Shut the fuck up." Because I know my son. And I know what he's doing. I know what's going on. You don't see behind the closed doors and all the stuff that he does. And you know what? I hate to say it, but to a lesser extent, that's how it is with a coach. Shut the fuck up, people. You don't know what's going on behind the scenes. You think he doesn't want to play Hernan Gomez? But it's just like, look at how this dude's playing. Now nobody's saying shit. And by the way, Kuzminskis is the odd man out. I've been said it because he's not hurt and he's not playing. And you don't want to just get rid of sessions because Jack was coming off a big injury. We don't know if he can play the whole season. What happens if he gets hurt? 
Then you have Baker, who's still, I don't know what's going on with him. And then you have no other backup for Frank. You don't want to th throw Frank in there for 40 minutes a game as a rookie. This is a rookie wall that's really real. So you don't want to just throw him in the game. So who is expendable? We have a lot of forwards and guards. A lot of people will say get rid of Beasley. But you know what? Beasley's one of those players you keep at the end of the bench. I'm glad he hasn't been in the rotation. But he's the type of guy, one of those games, like tonight, where you need a professional scorer. You're going to need somebody to come in, lift the team up. I guarantee, I don't guarantee, but I think he's going to get good minutes tonight. I think he's going to get about 20 minutes tonight. I have a feeling McDermott's going to get more minutes tonight. You need players that can come off the bench and literally not be complete garbage. And, Ku and last time I checked, Kuzminskis can't do what Beasley can do. I like him, but he's 28 years old. You know, I don't get emotional about players. I don't. I don't. I'm a Knicks fan. I care about the jersey. New York Knicks. Everybody else, I don't care about. If it, Look, if the Knicks got to make a move, they got to make a move. I like Chris Tapps. He's in a Knicks uniform. When he's not in a Knicks uniform, I ain't fucking with him. Period. I don't get emotionally attached to these players, man. Nah, I just want the Knicks to win. That's all I care about. Baker, if they get... Remember, matter of fact, I got an example. Remember people was emotionally attached to... Uh, What's his name? Tony Douglas. Oh, they're they not. Tony Douglas is out the league. Scrub. Remember Langston Galloway? Oh, they let Langston Galloway go. He's on his third team. He, he's on another team. He's so good, but they keep bouncing around the league. Now the new one is Justin Holiday because he's on Chicago and he's doing well. I don't pay attention to numbers on teams that where they're not winning. Your numbers only mean something when you're winning, because when you when you're losing and the games don't mean much, then. You, you're going to chuck. You're going to be comfortable. You're going to just play anyway. That's why I was telling people, even last year, when Hernan Gomez was doing what he was doing, I was like, look, this is the end of the season, and it doesn't count. I, 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 he looks good, but when it counts, that's when I got to pay attention. And when it doesn't count, I mean, it's like playing in the playground. Oh, I could just work on my craft here. Not saying he's a bum or anything. He's 22. He got plenty of time. He got plenty of time. If he keeps the right spirit, if he keeps the right mindset and keeps working yeah you behind two players you probably behind three players when Noah comes back but if he's able to overcome that trust me he's going to look back at that now don't get me wrong sometimes players get buried who shouldn't get buried that happened to Jalen Rose he talks about it a lot he said Larry Brown Larry Brown had benched him and he wasn't getting playing time and basically trying to push him out the league that could happen Excuse me, that could happen. So, you know, I want to see Hernan Gomez get some time. But not for at, at the sake of the team. It's a team game. And right now, those guys are playing well for the team. Okay? So I'm very impressed with 6-4. and four. It's going to be a tough game tonight. Orlando's been playing well. Uh, it's going to be tough. But I'll tell you, oh, and they put Chris Stapps at center. And, and and last thing before I go, you see what I was saying about Chris Stapps playing center? See how uh, how it was throwing him on the floor and beating him up? Guess what, folks? If he plays center, like, that's going to happen every night. That's going to happen anyway when he's not playing center. But, those, but usually when it happens, it's going to be a power forward doing it. And he's bigger than most of those guys. But... He plays center. He's going to be getting pushed on the ground, elbowed, poked. That's what they do. This is the NBA. It's big boy league. He's not ready to play no center. Now, he got his at the end, but he was getting beat up. You can't have your franchise player getting beat up like that, folks. That's why Dirk, I used to always wonder why Dirk doesn't play center. He, never, he played center maybe a couple of times, but he didn't really play center. Guess who else didn't play center, folks? Tim Duncan. He played power forward, even though we all feel he figured he was a center. Why? Because he had an advantage over every single power forward. Why would you switch that? That's just my opinion on it. That's just my opinion. I think you can switch him to center once he slows down as he gets older. But right now, leave him Leave him where's he at? Where he's at? You know? But don't get me wrong. It makes the Knicks more deadly when you put him at center. If you put a shooter at the four, yes. Eventually, you might go to that lineup. And it helps the defensive rotations. I get all of that. But this is not something you want to see Chris Stapps doing for the entire season until he's actually physically ready, and he's not ready for that yet. So, with that being said, this brings us to the end of Nick's home court, 
episode number 65. My name is Greg Armstrong. Let's get another win. To, let's get an improbable. Tonight's game will not be easy. If they lose by 20, don't even get mad. If they lose by two, don't even get mad. If they win, get very, very happy. Because that's that's a mark of a good team that can win like that. So and Because you got to understand, they played last night in the Garden. They made a big comeback. Then they got to fly out to Orlando the next day. I mean, that shit is rough, man. That's a rough schedule. Most of us, shit, if you had to work, it it, it didn't, right after work, they fly you to another place to go work. And your working was running and running up and down the class. That shit ain't easy, man. So anyway, like I said, I hope they have a good showing. I hope they win. Right now, I feel like this game is house money. I don't want them to think that way. But as a Knicks fan, I'm thinking this game is house money. As a young team, exuberant team i want them to be greedy i want them to think you know what we can win every game be greedy overachieve do it anyway nick's home court episode 65 your host greg armstrong everybody take care peace